Welcome to The Way We Roll with Simon Minty and Phil Friend. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Simon Minty. And my name is Phil Friend. We have decided, as well as having guests, we are going to do one show a month, which is just the two of us, or one-to-one, as I'm trying to get Phil to call it but he's not playing along. Um, And the idea being that's when we get a chance to explore things that we're interested in, to make each other laugh and get each other a bit annoyed, which is what we've always done. So uh, kicking off, first subject, Phil, what are we talking about? Um, I thought it might be interesting to have a few minutes with Alex Brooker, one of the co-presenters on the last leg, which began out of the Paralympics for in 2012 which people may or may not know um and alex brooker is a disabled guy um born with uh problems with his legs which led to an amputation and hands which aren't complete so he's got yeah. various bits missing fingers wise and so on and he did this um program an hour long which kind of explored well he in which he was exploring his kind of take on his life, his disability, and its impact on him, other people, and so on. Um, one of whom was his mum, who features a lot, and uh, it came over, I thought, as a lovely, lovely woman. Um, he's got six brothers. Uh, they were featured as well. Um, but actually, when Alex produced, I'd say produced, when, he, when this programme went out, I was struck by the Twitter feeds which then followed, which said, oh, it wasn't very social model. And um, all he talked about was medical stuff and things like that. You've seen it, Simon. I mean, what, what, what's your... Uh, I, there's a couple of bits to add on. Um, he won, or he was named as the most powerful disabled person last year in the that Sure Trust Power 100 oh, yeah. thing. Yeah. The year before, Baroness Jane Campbell was the most powerful, and the next year was Alex Brooker. Uh, and I said, well done to him. I, I, I like him. I, I like his television persona. And I, you know, I, I, I like the cut of his jib. As well as the, oh, it wasn't really a social model. And it was a bit too medical model. There was also a lot of Twitter going, he is an inspiration. He, look at what he's done. Look at what he's achieved. I am slightly anxious of this one. Because I wonder whether, and I hate this because it happens. But whether there's a twin track of disability going on here. and um explain what you mean i think there are a generation of people that the social model is everything and it is the the route to independence and access and it is also a, a, a fundamental mental way of belief or understanding yourself and there is others who are not and they are more about well whatever it may well be it could be coming over barriers uh, he called it disability in me oh sorry that was my twin track so there's people who just don't do that they think or well, they do do it they just don't realize what they're doing it i also remember my early days of disability rights it used to really drive me nuts because if i said something that people didn't think was social model they immediately said he's just not developed enough yet and i'm like what well, and they're like we well, just haven't got there yet and I'm like, oh, it used to really annoy me. But there's some truth in it. And it's part of that progression of acceptance and accepting of yourself. And he certainly admitted five times in it that he didn't know whether he accepted himself. Obviously, there were things like pain, but he, he didn't like certain bits, the limitations. I was stunned that, I mean, I must have, I didn't watch it all every minute of it i did that kind of reviewing type where you skip bits mm-hmm. but did they brought the six brothers come in at the very end i mean yeah. yeah this to me is fundamental of how he is to have six younger brothers all not disabled as far as i could tell yeah. that will influence his thinking about himself and that didn't come in until the very end well i tell you what was uh, my take on it was um this is a personal story about one man's journey and so on and so forth. So for me, the fact that he didn't do social model stuff and all of that was not really that relevant. He was making a film about himself. What I found really interesting was that he said several times and right at the end, his brother said it. Um, we've never really let his disability define him or I'm not, I'm not going to be defined by my disability. And I, That was the bit that I found most intriguing because of course it defined him. 
I mean, it was everything, you know? He had a very, very interesting conversation with a para-athlete para woman swimmer who had a very similar condition to him. She had a, an arm and a hand missing and so on. And she, she obviously an elite athlete. And they were talking about their appearance and how she wouldn't get undressed and, and so on at public baths when she was younger and so on and so forth. And then overcame that in whatever way she did. And he, he resonated with that. So his disability was defining him. It was just, he didn't kind of, and I'm not, I enjoyed the program. I thought he's a really nice bloke. He sort of spoke his mind. He was very basic and very blunt and very entertaining, actually. I had some empathy. He does a bit about comedy and his mate from school. You could see poor old Alex because his mate, um, he, Alex says, I always worry that doing comedy around disability, am I just the jester? Am I allowing people to laugh at my disability and where's my line and where's my dignity? And I totally get that as someone who does stand up and someone who's short as well. And then his mate said, sometimes I think, you know, the jokes, yeah, they're a bit, bit rubbish, aren't they? And a bit cheap. And poor old Alex, he's <laughs> a, Alex looked like he was going to cry through about 40 minutes of the show. And that was one of the moments he went, oh, and he knew it. It was like, bugger. Because I, I want the respect of my disabled peers. I want them to like the comedy that I do. I don't want them to think... Uh, I mean, he started at the beginning going, this isn't going to be one of those pity me, he yeah. said. Um, I am very privileged. Uh, the life I've got is great. Unfortunately, and I blame producers or directors, there was quite a lot of plinky plonky piano music. There was quite a lot of him walking down corridors, walking differently, leaning one way or the other. And and whichever way you want to look at it, that that is what he was, trying. I think, trying to avoid. That's the... This is all medical. This is the doctors that are the solution. That's where the social model was missing. He didn't say, if we change this and we change that, that would have been better. Or, or the people, the generation before me have made disability more acceptable, so my life's a lot easier. There was a little bit of a lack or a lack of that. Um, because in one way, though, um, to be fair, and you, this is you demonstrating your inner knowledge of these things, I, I must admit, I didn't really think about the way it had been edited and cut and so on and plinky plonky music. Although I was, I am usually aware of plinky plonky music, but what we don't know is what was left on the floor, you know, in the cutting room. So whether there were bits, but you're, you're absolutely right about that. The way in which that film was cut and shaped was the producer and editor. I'm not so I don't know how much Alex Brooker was involved in that bit. But this is why I would push back because Alex is not a novice. He's no. been around television for a long time. This is disability in me. I mean, I've made television programs and they've done it. And I've said, I'm not having that go out. You've got to change it. You, he could do that unless he's given over all editorial control. But I cannot. That was a what you call an authored piece. That was him. Yeah. Unless he was just being a presenter. But no, this was him. He could have said, and maybe he's all right with it. Jump back. The word defining. Mm. I think the, that's. Def, I think the definition of defining is wrong. I think when people say it's not going to define me, I think what they're trying to say is I'm not going to let it beat me. Yeah. I'm not going to let it rule me. Well, there's lots so I'm, I've learned to come to terms with. There was a lot of that in it. Coming to yeah, terms with it. But we can say disability defines part of us because it would be weird if it didn't. That's the point. But I, I don't feel that's a lesser thing. I don't no, think no. I've given in. I think I've taken control of it. No, I'm talking about not you, other people who say, I'm not going to let disability find me. What they mean is I'm not going to use a wheelchair. I'm going to refuse any acknowledgement about bigger disability. And I'm going to make my life quite hard. Yeah, I wanted him on my PDP course. <laughs> I, I wanted him on my PDP course. Which I want is your, with, <laughs> I your want personal development him, program. Yeah. I want him to buy the book, Why yeah. It would Be Normal. I wanted to say to him, you learn to live with, you don't come to terms with, because if you yeah. come to terms with, you kind of, it's done, and it never yeah. is. And I get what you say about defining. I don't, I wasn't meaning, I wasn't being critical. I didn't mean you either. No, I think he, what he was saying was exactly that. I'm trying to make sure that my life isn't ruled by this bloody thing. Yeah. Um, but actually, you know, he had it from birth, so it wasn't something he acquired, you know, it was shaping every bit of him. Well, he says it. He says at the end, or towards the end, when he's sitting with his mum, he said, I never 
will stop thinking about it. I think I'm always going to think about it. Mm. And he said, it might be easier to think about, but I'll never stop thinking about it. I did think, okay, social model and where I'm at. I did feel slightly that I've got that. I don't think about being short all the time. Of course, I bloody don't. I do it with you because we do these shows. I sometimes do it as a profession, but it's not every minute. It, it's kind of, it's faded. It's just part of the landscape. Um, You're a bit surprised. I can remember this. I used to be a bit surprised when I went past a shop window back in the day when I was young and I saw this bloke on crutches and thought, who's that? Oh, that's me. Yeah, because yeah. I wasn't yeah. thinking I'm on crutches. I was now I'm in a wheelchair permanently. I, 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 I'm, I'm perhaps less surprised than I used to be. Who's that um, old bloke? <laughs> this is the hierarchy of disability and me being a, 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 an irritant. Um, when he starts the show, he gets out of the tube he walks into the tube and like well i can't do that i immediately said well i couldn't do that like alex you're so bloody lucky walking into the tube uh then he got in a cab any cab he could just jump into i'm like oh well you don't even know anything about this alex (laughs) anyway he got on with it and but he also i in my selfish stupid head i was thinking he's less visible could he pass could he pass? And then he says a beautiful line later on, and I just got him where he said, I'm walking down the street and they stare at me. Mm. And he says, I'm fierce. Immediately I'm fierce. Immediately I want to spin around and go, what the hell are you looking at? That's his instinct. That's his mm. retaliation. Mm. And then before he's got it out, they say to him, I love your show. <laughs> and he goes, oh, oh. That just mm. pulls the rug from under his feet. And, and that is the bit we forget. We go straight to defensive which means we're still working it out yet. Some people are just cool. They like it. Yeah, no, that was a, you're right. That was a very, that was a very, very good moment. Um, and, and great that they left it in, you know, it wasn't, that wasn't taken out because it was a very powerful moment. But yeah. I, it leads to the, another agenda item, something else I wanted to just touch on really, um, which was the recent, absolute storm on Twitter and Facebook and wherever else um, lambasting people for taking positions. I mean, the, the quote is the, the JK Rowling thing around um, trans people and so on. And, and I'm not getting into that. That's, that's come not, on, Phil, <laughs> well, where are you at on this? I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't feel I know enough about it to be able to have a comment really. Oh, um, well that just shows how much you care. No, that's but, what they say. <laughs> but anyway, what really concerns me is the free speech angle of this mm. and, and the fact that people on social media speak, they say what they think about something. Maybe that's why I'm not doing it here because I'm a bit worried about what might happen to me if I did. Um, you know, so there's this sort of self editing going on all the time. And I just wondered what you thought about that because you know, you're, you've been in the media, you are part of that. I am too, to be fair, but, the attacks on people for saying things that they believe, um, it, it's not that people disagree with them, that's fine. It's the vile, unbelievably vitriolic responses that people get. And then I know we could call it trolling and, and those things. Where Where's this all gonna end? Because things, I, I remember doing some work years ago where we were looking at prejudice and discrimination in a more theoretical, and the thing about Germany and the Jews and the Nazis was it began with name calling. It began with people uh, making fun of and joking about, and it kind of escalated then to bullying. Then it got into violence and then we all know where it ended up. Now I'm not wanting to make too many direct comparisons, but that is how these things start. And it doesn't seem we can control social media. So how the hell do we manage this stuff? Um, but I, I feel there's a slight difference in that um, that was targeted to a group of people for how they lived, their religion, their culture, that kind of stuff. What the what, thing. Yeah, with, with, with the Harper's um, letter from all these eminent people saying, stop, no platforming us, stop cancelling different points of view just because you don't agree. That isn't a particular type of people. Or you could say it's the, the elite. It, that was one argument. But they're all mixed people. It's their thoughts, the things that they're believing or things that they've studied or the, the science that they're coming from. That's the, so it's, it's what people think that's being attacked at the moment. And 
I, I think Jeff, our lovely colleague and friend, he said a lovely line, and I used this in a speech I did this week talking about disability. And I said, these days, if you make a mistake, you're crucified. I mean, mm. it's just full on. You can be absolutely ridiculed and lambasted and that, that crowd mentality, and it's, it's terrifying. I, if you make a deliberate mistake, you're going to get a bit of my tongue. Absolutely. But I know there's lots of people who make genuine mistakes. And you just said, and I'm the same, we wouldn't know everything about certain communities and we need to learn, whatever. But if you're making a genuine mistake, that doesn't make you my enemy. And that's the problem. It feels that if someone does make a mistake, there is nowhere to go. You're dead. You're finished. Do you remember a long time ago, we did a Dining with a Difference with our old mate, James Partridge, and there was a group of people from various companies who came along and sat with us and broke bread with us. And, and the idea was, for those that didn't know, was that we would do a kind of disability conversation over a meal and challenge people and stuff. And one of the people in that room had a bit too much to drink. And as a result of that, inhibitions disappeared. And he started saying all sorts of things about disability, which I kind of knew many of the people in the room were thinking, but were too terrified to say. Now, looking back on that, we could have said to him, you, you know, we could have really gone for him. But it was actually in a learning environment. So what he was saying gave us an opportunity to challenge what he was saying and to say why what he was saying didn't necessarily, you know, was a bit old hat and whatever, whatever, whatever. And I thought that was a glorious opportunity to help somebody move on. If I get attacked, if we'd gone for him, yeah, I, think, I think he would not have ever gone back to that subject again. And he certainly wouldn't have gone to a dinner like that. And he would have kept his mouth shut. Um, so my, my, as I continued my speech this week, I said, uh, there are three types of people. There's the ones who just get it and they're so cool and calm and aren't they amazing? Then there's the big majority of us who sort of have to learn it and get a bit anxious, but we want to develop, yada, yada, and, but we have good intentions. And then there's the dinosaurs. And I said, they are my favorite because as you say, they're the people that I know exactly where they're at. And that gives me a chance to undermine their argument. And often they become the greatest ally. Mm. Um, I, my nephew, who Max, who is about 23, listens to our show. And uh, I asked him when the statues were coming down, I said, you're a next generation. What, what's going on with this? What I, I, need to, I need to understand. And he said, it's got something to do, if it's got something to do with slavery, it comes down. And we were saying, but it's complex, isn't it? There's this and there was a time and place and, and there were these good things. And he's like, doesn't matter. It's slavery, pull it down. And I'm struck by there's a simplicity of argument that is very hard to push back against. But what the Harper's letter was saying, some of the arguments we're talking about are so complex, there's so many levels to this, that it's really hard to be just precise. I would then also add on what I quite admire about the next generation, their rebellion is they're like, yes, you've been debating all the nuances for years and things haven't changed. So we got to cut through it. I, I, I haven't got an answer because I'm still probably a bit older and a bit more, mm, it's a bit more complex than that. I think one of the other things that was said around the statues idea was that of course, if you remove them, then we stop seeing them. So then we forget about it all completely. And there's a chance that generations, <laughs> I, I love the idea. Was it Hungary or somewhere I heard? They got all the statues of the nasties, stuck them all in the same park and then put loads of information about each one of them. So you could go in there and see just how despotic they were. Yeah, yeah. despots. It was despots. It was people like that. Um, of all newspapers, my friend Shorto sent me the Daily Mail, and they had done a whole article. It was massive on all these statues and the people and, and the good and the bad that they'd done. Mm. And I sent it to Max and said, look, have a read, because you'll then see the bigger picture. There is an element that sometimes I've seen this around certain arguments. People will go, well, one in three of us are, are this way. And some will go, well, actually, but all the science and the research says it's about one in 2000. And then people go, well, who knows? Who knows what it could be? So there is a, there's a bit of a, a lack of, of evidence. What is great is it is a very supportive culture of those who may be marginalized. That is evident. The slight risk we've got is we are absolutely smashing to bits people who could be allies they're not the enemy 
but just because they're not quite up to speed, it, it's difficult. It's really difficult. I think the worry, I suppose, just to finish on it, is is the is what it's doing to the ability of people to speak their mind and say yeah. things, and then giving others of us a chance to challenge them and, and maybe shift their view. I don't know. Well, I think you're right. And actually where you're alluding to, if you go back to your opening point, will this feeling go underground and become nastier and more vicious and more scary? I, if I write a tweet, I will think about it twice. Mm. Uh, our friend Baroness Jane Campbell, uh, straight into Alex Brooker. Oh, two medical model, where's the social model? And thanks Jane for linking me into that one. So, uh, and I didn't know and I thought, am I getting sucked into an argument here? Uh, how do I feel? I hadn't watched the show at one point, but it's difficult because I can't speak my mind. But then I think, well, social media, is that the place to speak your mind? To be fair, I mean, all Jane did was say this was a missed opportunity in a sense. That wasn't in it. This wasn't in it. He didn't say much about that. That's okay. I'm okay with that. I, you know, if somebody wants to put a view of something up in a polite, respectful sort of way, which is what Jane did, I'm fine. No problem. Well, she, when she, they but, go for the, the put downs and the... Oh, I, I totally agree. She wasn't nasty. And at the end, she said, if you want to have a lesson, come and speak to me. <laughs> which you could say is patronising, and someone underneath said, I hope someone, he tells you to go and stuff your lesson. Uh, and someone else said, don't you think you're a bit long in the tooth? Now, I admire people. That's why Jane does what she does, because she's got that force of personality, and she can back it up as well. Yeah. I, I think it's a weakness of mine. I sometimes think, get off the fence, Minty, and, you know, take a position on something. But... Um, Right, Alex Booker, there's an open invite to come on our PDP courses anytime you want to, no problem. Well, no, then you're asking him to give him a bloody lesson. But Alex, just come on the show. It'd be lovely to have you on our show oh, and tell yeah. us. No, that would yeah. be better. Yeah, uh, free. Okay, is it my turn? Um, Simon, yeah, what have you got? What's on your agenda? <laughs> <laughs> I love the way you say it. like American chat show host. Yeah, yeah. what's getting your goat? Age this <laughs> Oh, we both spoke over each other. I don't know which one's going to come out on the record there. But... Give me, I'll edit the thing. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, there is a US activist who has sadly died. Her name was Stacey Park. Um, it sort of links to what we were talking about. So there's a, another guy I know called Joe Stramando. Joe is a short man. Uh, he's a philosopher um, and a, a lecturer. And I, I saw he put up a, um, a post on Facebook. I will try and cut to the essence of it, but I want to just talk about it. She said she was, he, Joe said of Stacey, she was one of the few people who was significantly younger than I am, but uh, was a mentor to me. She was very patient with my white, overeducated, middle class, you know, uh, thinking and so on and so forth. He says he's got lots of examples, but one, he was in the Bay Area for a conference. She came across the whole city. She was a profoundly disabled woman. Um, we just all sat in the lobby, just had a chat. And I adore this. I do that when I'm in the States with my short people. You have those big chats till the early hours. He said, Joe says, I mentioned to her, I was interested in doing more writing on disability pride. And Stacy very quickly got me rethinking. Paraphrasing, she said, dude, I know we've talked about this before. Don't you know how alienating talk of disability pride is to many people? A lot of people are struggling, especially people with mental health or poor disabled people. You're, you're not talking to them when you're talking about pride. What we need is community. Everybody understands and appreciates community. That's what disabled people have been denied and need more than anything. My line is, I've been banging on about pride for ages. I read this comment and I thought, oh, Stacey, you've just educated me as well. Do you think that also goes back to Alex Brooker, you and me, Jane? Have we got community? Have we lost community? Is it important? Well, we watched, didn't we? And we were both impressed by and moved by. And we had Judy Human on um, a show when we looked at the Crip Camp film on Netflix. And that, what would, that was about was a community. It was about people who'd had similar experiences. They've been through similar kinds of things. I think, <clears throat> certainly speaking for myself, I, I went to special school. I spent many years in hospitals with people who had had polio and so on. 
<clears throat> and there was a sense of community, I think. Um, there was certainly a sense of solidarity or, or something of that sort. We, we seemed to understand each other. Um, we weren't all different, of course we were, but we had that experience which was common. That definitely has gone because we've moved on. I mean, there are still special schools, and, but he, people don't spend years in hospitals now generally, and they don't, they don't have the opportunities to be with their peers in that way uh, as they used to do. So in that sense, I guess communities gone I, a pride for me is always more of a movement of rights things it's always felt like gay pride you know it's always been about fighting for something and in 95 when the dda came in the disability discrimination act in one sense that was a culmination although there were lots of disagreements about that there were, that was the culmination for disabled people in the uk to achieve rights of some sort um so i separate pride and community in, I see pride is more political. Is that? Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, you made me think of a few things. Maybe, and I'm jumping back to Alex. Alex hadn't hung out with a lot of disabled people, that's for sure. Right. Okay. He, he had his friend at school, and you saw Alex Brooker meet up with him. And both of them, when they heard the word crip, said it made them wince. Yes. Uh, and I, I'm in that generation. I still i am not convinced it was great to reclaim it, but I get it. I do get it. Um, that next generation, if you haven't all hung out when you're growing up, then your community is online. That's mm -hmm. how you know people, unless you, I don't know, football matches. There was a, all the Arsenal supporters. Oh, there was, yeah, yeah. I do, pride is, is political. I've never thought of it as just purely rights. I do think it's a political statement. It's a bit of, it's so counter the orthodoxy of, I love being me. And what I have is joyous and I love this rather than you think I'm limited or defective or whatever your phrase you want to use. And, and that's why I adore it because it takes us away from the, Oh, I'm not sure about myself to, you know what? And he does say, yeah, he says, uh, this is what I've been given. I mean, that's a big change of phrase. This is what I've been given, not this is what I've lost. This is what I've been given. And I'm with that. So I'm a big fan of the pride bit, but, this community, if there's not the community there first, there's a, a relatively uh, younger person I know, Becky, who couldn't believe the community on Crip Camp. This was something that was new. So do you think Stace is right? Have we, have we missed a trick? Do we need to go back to get the community stronger and the pride will come from that? Yeah, I, I do think we've lost the community. I mean, although it may be online and, and so on. And one of the things that we've, you've heard universally said during the COVID thing is how we miss being with each other. Now, why wouldn't that be true for disabled people? Why, when we run our PDP courses, one of the most glorious things about them is that people are together with people who have not got the same things, but have lived through similar kinds of discrimination or prejudice or whatever you want to call it. So there is a sense of community comes out of that where I am not on my own. There are others a bit like me. There are others who get this. The pride bit, thinking of the marches, the celebration of myself with others. That's much more, as you just said, it's much more about um, I love I love being like this. I love who I am and I love being with people who are like me. That's the sort of pride bit that I'm, and I am speaking as an old person now. I'm, I'm very clear on that, I think. Do you get that? Um, I asked them to call you just so I could jump in at that point. Uh, I think Sue's Sue, Sue picked it up. Um, I'll, I'll obviously deal with that. Um, I was saying, I, 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 as an older person, I think I'm, I'm not as in touch, I think, with pride as perhaps I would have been if I'd been 20 now or 30, perhaps. So my two instincts of pride, I go to a LPA, Little People of America, or uh, the UK uh, equivalents, and there's 20 of us and we all go out and, oh my goodness me, we get every look that you can imagine, but we... We own it. We absolutely control it. I also have had it with Liz Carr and her partner, Joe, and we'll be in the States and we'll go down the high street and there's someone who's walking, there's a wheelchair user, there's a short person on a scooter and we own the pavement. 
and we're playing with this. We're messing with this. We're, we've got absolute control. People don't know what's going on. I mean, it's an immense sense of pride when that happens. And you, you know, you can fill the chest. That only comes from hanging out with people who are like me. So that community bit is the bit that takes me on. You remind me of riding for the disabled when I was about 18 or 19. And I'd left special school. I was working. I was on my own as a disabled person. I didn't know anyone else. And a riding school started in Chigwell. A bunch of us from my old school plus one or two others started going there at weekends and the bit that you just reminded me of is when this group of 10 or 12 young mainly men there were one or two women with us went into the king's arms in chigwell in the public bar we took the place over we usually played darts we ended up always slightly sloshed and we all began to sing and we were all in the school choir so we all kind of knew stuff we would take the pub over. It was unbelievable. And I did it for about four years, this, this every Saturday, every weekend. And I look back on that now as being vital to keeping in touch with my, in my, you know, use that expression, my roots, so that I could negotiate my way into this world of non-disabled people that I was inhabiting for the rest of the week. And you just reminded me of that. And that was that was in, oh, we were very proud of who we were and what we, the trouble was they all thought we were inspirational of course but i also i can imagine if i'd gone in with my average sized friends there might be a couple of minutes of working out whether we're going to play darts and whether i can reach and all that sort of stuff if i go in with my short friends there is no conversation about that you're straight into it um and that darts are going all over the pub <laughs> well no it's still pretty accurate you patronizing what's it but um oh, you but I've forgotten that. Yeah, <laughs> I am. Uh, uh, but uh, so I think if, if uh, you see, I'm sounding like an old bloke. If I was the next, Martin, we've had Martin Sibley on our show recently, and he talked about how he can call someone in Australia with the same condition as him yeah. and how powerful that is for him and how great it is. I totally get that. I think we're also saying it's lovely if you can actually hang out in the flesh as well. Um, it's even better. I don't yeah. think it's the only way, but it's certainly. And I think that's what a lot of people have said of the COVID thing, not being able to touch and be and hug and those things has been horrendous for so many of us. Really. Um, Stacey <laughs> Park, may she rest in peace. I, uh, uh, I knew of her, never met her, but I love it when I read something and someone, you read something that someone said and you go, oh, you've made me rethink everything I ever thought. And <laughs> that's always powerful. I, I suppose the link to some of what we've just been saying is I came across an article in the Guardian. Um, I think you sent me it actually. I'm you sent me the link. Yeah. Um, and it's it's um, it's about a guy called Paul Alexander who got polio like myself. Um, he got it in '52. The thing that's really fascinating about this man and the story that's in the Guardian is that he he's now 74. He's one of the last people in the world still using an iron lung, something I spent six, seven weeks in myself. Um, having week? Some, uh, seven, seven or eight weeks, yeah. I thought you were in it for years on and off, weren't no, you? No, 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 no. Six, oh, okay. Seven. You've milked that before. Okay. Well, I like, you know, sometimes it works. Anyway, he, he, um, he was six when he went in. He's oh. still in it. He's now 75. It is the most remarkable story. And I just, <laughs> if I just read out a couple of quotes in this article. Can I ask a favour first? There may be people who don't know what an iron lung is. Okay. So how would you describe an iron lung? Yeah, that's the old man thing, isn't it? It's a breathing machine. Um, there's been a lot of talk about... Um, uh, oh, ventilators. And ventilators and so on. Basically, you lie inside a big metal box, curved metal box. It sucks air out, so your lungs expand, and then it pushes push the air back in, and your lungs are forced to expel air. It, it takes over your breathing function. It was very, very crude in its day, but of course it saved lots of lives, mine included. Um, and Paul, this chap, nowadays you'd have a tracheotomy probably and have a pipe in your, your right. neck. So, just a couple of quick quotes on this. Um, what made polio so terrifying was that there was no way of predicting who would walk away from an infection with a headache and who would never walk again. 
In most cases, the disease had no discernible effect. Of the 30% or so who showed symptoms, most experienced only minor illness, but a small proportion, 4 to 5%, exhibited serious symptoms, including extreme muscular pain. Da, da, da. What does that remind you of? Does that remind you of anything? <laughs> uh, lockdown! Uh, oh, my God. Let me read this bit. In places where the outbreaks occurred, families sheltered in fear at home with the windows shut, all kinds of public gathering places closed, human interactions were laced with uncertainty. According to the historian David Oshinsky, some people refused to talk on the phone out of concern that the virus would be transmitted down the line. During the first major outbreak in New York in 1916, 72,000 cats and 8,000 dogs were killed in one month after a rumour went round that the animals transmitted the disease. They Goodness died. me. This, I, as I was reading this, this is a remarkable story, by the way, of a man's resilience. I mean, unbelievable. He qualified as a lawyer and never, ever went to college. He did it all from his bedroom. What does that remind you of? This is way before social media. He, oh, that's extraordinary. Yeah, he took the bar, isn't it, where you become the fully fledged. And they said, and he, because he was paralyzed from the neck down. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and he had a slight movement in his thumb that he sort of raised slightly as a sort of swearing the allegiance to do the, I don't know, the honest or the right thing or whatever he had to swear. Um, and it was just a tiny little movement of the thumb that there was the yeah. acknowledgement. And, and that you wouldn't have seen because it was inside the honor. He did learn to breathe in a way which allowed mm. him for a short time to be outside the machine. But this is very poignant. Uh, another quote, he and the other children tried to communicate by making faces each other at each other. But Paul said, every time I made a friend, they die. Because so many children in iron lungs didn't survive. I mean, it was a, and you kind of, you get this sense of, this man has spent 75 years in isolation, more or less. And it resonates today with some of what people are facing, you know? There was a couple of bits. He, uh, he's got a few friends. And they, he's written his uh, biography, autobiography, that took eight years because he had to sort of do it with his mouth, uh, tapping out letters, or um, one of his friends. And he's got a few friends. It, it's not... It sounds like he's had a relatively full life. He's not spent his whole life in the iron lung. He's had time out. Um, the bit, and I feel a bit old school myself, the bit that just made me really warm to this person, there's a photo of him. And maybe that links back to his time with the kids. He's, his head's just popped out of this massive yeah. Yeah. iron lung machine. And he's beaming. And then there's another one. He's got a, a what's it called? A paintbrush in his mouth. And he's dabbing away and i just looked i thought oh i just want to go and hang out with him he, his face has just got life and energy and something interesting about it um he's it's it's remarkable because of the the sheer wasting of muscle his body inside the machine is still like a child's it's just obviously shrunk but because he uses everything is done with his face he's got jaw muscles that are enormous because he's controlled, as you say, the pen, the painting, and all those things with his jaw. And in order to keep the vacuum, his head has to be completely encased. You know, it has to be airtight, yeah. the thing around his neck. So you're right. What you get is this round head sticking out of this great metal box. And apparently people come for miles. When he's in hospital, people come for miles just to look at it because they've never seen one. Um, it's so old hat. Um, there are several photos of him out of the Iron Lung. The bit that I think we're very fortunate to live where we do now, or in the time that we do now, any time I see these 70-year-old photos, they're all in suits and ties. <laughs> yes. And I'm thinking, if you've got a major impairment and you've got to go through the hassle of putting on shirts and ties and suits, nowadays you're just in a pair of jogging pants and a sweatshirt. But um, <laughs> like, the fact that he was so smart, but... Uh, no, I, I thought it was a it was quite a joyous article, not in a twee patronizing way. There was there was something, but they, they said we had someone in the UK up until 2017 who was living in an iron lung as well. I used to know a group. This is going further back. They were called the Respinauts. They were all people in iron lungs, and they formed a little group. This is way before social media and stuff, and they set up a little magazine of their own, which they edited and sent out. And you know, obviously they had support to do it, but. Yeah, that was the, 
I don't really remember the Iron Lung myself. I have one or two memories of it, but um, to have spent your entire life yeah. in it and being dependent on it uh, is remarkable. We'll put the notes for the article for people to have a proper look at. Yeah, just uh, sort of thought brought things down to earth, really, <laughs> reading that. Yeah, your, your recognition that COVID of its time was, was this is polio, presumably, yeah. terrifying bit of it. Yeah. Uh, is is quite stark. Yeah, and and I go I go we, you know today's world we one of the things that Paul says in the article is he doesn't want people ever to forget polio and what it did. Well, we've now got COVID, which isn't the same at all, but it, it but it's an epidemic and it frightens people, no question. All right, we done. I think we probably are, aren't we? I think we. Thanks for coming. Yeah, it was good to see you again, Simon. See you very soon, perhaps. Yeah, take good care. Uh